and being a strong advocate for better and easier uh, place to do business so that the uh, economic growth of Ukraine can rapidly move forward and benefit the people of Ukraine. We're very pleased today to have on this webinar over 250 people have registered and we appreciate uh, your interest. We're very uh, pleased to have such a high level distinguished panel, all of who have been in Ukraine, uh, involved in Ukraine activities for many, many years. Uh, first, I'll introduce the panelists and I'll introduce our special guest. First, I introduce Steve Nix. Steve Nix has been involved in Ukraine for 20, 25 years. He's the regional director for Eurasia, for the International Republican Institute, and he lived in Ukraine for several years. Next, I'll introduce Jeannie Lopato. Jeannie works for Westinghouse. Westinghouse is the only uh, company in the world that makes nuclear fuel that fits into Soviet reactors. They play a very important role in the nuclear fuel industry of Ukraine for many years. Jeannie heads up their Washington office. And then Mark Levin, I, Mark, I met Mark Levin in two, 2000. Mark is uh, one of the top uh, uh, persons who advocates in Washington uh, for human rights, civil rights, human dignity, and protection of uh, all, all of races and creeds, and, and uh, particularly the group that he represents. And so we're very pleased to have him on today. And then finally, we have uh, Ambassador Vladimir Yelchenko. He's an experienced career diplomat. He spent many years in New York uh, working with the UN delegation from Ukraine. And about a year and a half, he was appointed ambassador of Ukraine to the United States. He's had a very distinguished uh, time as ambassador. We had three meetings with him in January, February of 2000. And we expected to have a lot more. And then, of course, as you know, the pandemic hit. So then we had to turn to uh, Zoom meetings. And this is, I think, the third or fourth Zoom meeting he's been on for the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. So, Ambassador, first, we want to thank you for your very long and distinguished service to the people of Ukraine in representing them at the United Nations and now representing them in Washington. Uh, so our special thanks from all of our members and from all the panelists for your distinguished career. And now, sir, we'd like to turn it over to you for some of your reflections, observations, commentary about you, your career representing uh, them at the United Nations and now in Washington. And, and uh, any comments you have, again, because we're all interested in moving uh, with new people in place the U.S.-Ukraine relationship forward, stronger, better, more significant. So, Ambassador, thank you. We turn it over to you. Uh, well, good morning, and thank you very much, Morgan, for organizing this, for bringing us together. Uh, I would limit my intervention to, uh, as you said, uh, some some reflections, some you know general feelings about uh, uh, what was done during the last year. And, and of course, then I would be more than happy to, to answer any questions and to uh, uh, actively participate in the discussion uh, we're going to have. Uh, uh, well, first of all, thank you again uh, and, and uh, thank to your team uh, for all your support of my work here in Washington, D.C. As well as, of course, for the decades uh, uh, of your efforts aimed at strengthening and developing U.S.-Ukraine business ties. And not just business ties, but uh, personal relations, relations between different agencies uh, of Ukraine and the United States. Uh, <clears throat> I'm truly grateful to, to all of you uh, uh, for active participation uh, in our multiple events during the last year which of course were limited by pandemic, but uh, as Morgan rightly said, uh, we were not losing our time and we were trying to use the best technologies to continue our interaction. Uh, given the current challenges, it is difficult to overestimate the importance uh, of your active engagement in the development of economic cooperation between Ukraine and the United States. Uh, 
due to coronavirus uh, and quarantine restrictions, both in Ukraine and the US, a number of our projects uh, are developing not as fast uh, as we would like to see. At the same time, the pandemic forced us to be more creative, flexible, and even more aggressive in promoting further development of our bilateral cooperation. Uh, now we know much better how to work in this new environment, how to use more broadly new high-tech instruments of communication, how to hold virtual meetings and negotiations. Even if all of these new tools cannot substitute personal communication and personal touch, all of that gave us good chances to continue cooperation despite the pandemic. I would like to underline that this gave us a result. Last year, for example, we have managed to increase the export of goods to the United States, which reached almost 1 billion US dollars. Moreover, our export of services increased by 7.8% and reached 1.39 billion. Greater uh, numbers of our services export clearly demonstrate changes in the structure of the Ukrainian economy. We are becoming more concentrated on high-tech IT and telecommunication technologies, which nowadays represent the main share of our export to the United States. Overall, Ukrainian IT export grew up by 20% in 2020, with further promising expectations for this year. Last year, Ukraine, as almost all other countries around the world, has faced the consequences of the global economic recession caused by the pandemic. At the same time, we have managed to sustain economic stability and implement many anti-crisis measures. Ukraine's real GDP decline showed down to 0.7% in the last quarter of 2020. Ukraine's state budget revenues grew by 30%, 30% in January 2021, and our international reserves amounted to 28.5 billion as of the end of February 2021. As a result, Fitch ratings affirmed Ukraine's rating at B with a stable outlook. In close touch with the new US administration, we are working together on additional steps in all spheres of US-Ukraine bilateral relations. Among other priorities, special attention will be paid to new economic opportunities and further improvement of the business climate in Ukraine. I am confident that our joint efforts will boost the bilateral trade. We continue to extend our presence in the United States in order to be closer and more engaged in the needs of our citizens and businesses. This year, we will open a new consulate general in Houston. It should have happened last year, but unfortunately, again, uh, uh, as a result of pandemics, we had to postpone it. Uh, and in this regard, I would like to express my special thanks to you, Morgan, for your valuable involvement in the process of establishing Ukraine's diplomatic mission in Texas. Well, dear friends, finally, uh, for this part of, of our discussion, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you and wish you new success stories in Ukraine. Stay healthy, stay with us, stay with Ukraine. And I will always remain at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, uh, for your remarks. And again, once again, thank you for all the wonderful things you've done uh, in your many years of engagement with US-Ukraine uh, business relations. We'll come back to you uh, very shortly. Next, let's turn. Our, our agenda today is rather broad. We're going to be talking about business. We're going to be talking about legal and judicial, civil society, democracy, human rights, civil rights. So we're covering a broad landscape today, all of which are important for U.S.-Ukraine uh, uh, relationships and for building a strong, democratic, prosperous country in Ukraine. So now let's turn since we're a business organization and our job is to uh, promote business and create wealth and jobs for people of Ukraine, let's turn it to Jeannie Lopato. Jeannie's the uh, Vice President, Government and 
international affairs uh, head for Westinghouse in Washington, has been for many years. Westinghouse has been a major player in Ukraine for a long time. I first got deeply connected with Westinghouse about 22 years ago, and we've been working with them in a very important area for a long time. So Jeannie, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, give us some uh, your observations and insights about your work and Westinghouse and your, the important area you cover in Ukraine. Okay, thank you, Morgan. Uh, and thank you to the US-Ukraine Business Council for convening this panel today. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, it's very nice to see you again. So uh, Westinghouse is a nuclear energy company. We design uh, nuclear reactors, we manufacture nuclear fuel, and we uh, service reactors around the world, and we also decommission uh, reactors. We, uh, we have been in Ukraine since 1992. Uh, we were a recipient of Nun Luger funding that was designed to retrain Ukrainian engineers who had been working on the Soviet missile guidance systems. Um, and we retrained them to uh, develop and deploy nuclear safety upgrades for Ukrainian nuclear power plants. These plants were vastly behind in Western safety standards for nuclear safety and Westinghouse helped bring those safety standards up to modern standards. Um, also in the 1990s, uh, the United States Department of Energy sponsored a program to introduce Western nuclear fuel technology and hardware into Ukraine and Westinghouse um, was able to develop nuclear fuel technology um, for Ukraine's reactors, which were uh, Russian made reactors. And this has led, this has been a very successful program. It's led to commercial contracts and Westinghouse now serves as an alternative nuclear fuel provider for Ukraine. Whereas previously their only choice was to buy the fuel from Russia. And I'm pleased to say that today over half of the nuclear reactors in Ukraine are fueled by Westinghouse. So we're very proud of that. We consider Ukraine and specifically Energo Atom, the um, nuclear company, to be one of our most important customers. And certainly that's for commercial reasons, but also we understand the significance of fuel diversification effort and uh, the full value of Ukraine having competition for their fuel supply. So in terms of business environment in Ukraine, we've been there for many years and we've had our struggles and we've run into occasional obstacles, but things have improved over the years as, and there have been um, changes that have been positive. I think in general terms, and I'm sure I'm not the only company that would say this, but it's, it's very important for um, the, a company to uh, develop trust uh, with its customer. And the customer has to be, uh, have trust in the product. And the vendor has to trust that the customer is going to adhere to the terms of the contract. So I think um, adherence to contracts and transparency in government regulations and certainly in such a highly regulated industry as nuclear energy, um, we have to adhere to export control laws of both countries. So these are all areas where it's necessary for businesses to operate successfully. And certainly uh, what is very helpful is um, sound uh, relationship between um, the two governments, in this case, the United States and Ukraine government. Um, certainly, we, we've seen that develop over the years, and the U.S. has a similar goal of helping Ukraine increase its energy diversity. So I think I'll stop there, Morgan, and you can move on. Jeannie, thank you very much uh, for that uh, work. And we're very pleased that Westinghouse has stayed the course. There's been many times, uh, as she said, ups and downs. And for some companies, it would have been easy just to withdraw and go to easier markets. Uh, but they made more than a business decision. They made a long-term commitment to Ukraine, as she said, beyond just their commercial interest, because they know the value of Ukraine 
and they know that the United States was very supportive of finding a, an alternative nuclear fuel source for Ukraine for reasons which we understand. So we mm -hmm. thank for Westinghouse for staying the course. Now let's turn to Mark Levin. I met Mark over 20 years ago. He has been working in his field of expertise for almost 40 years. He is executive vice chairman and CEO of the National Coalition Supporting Eurasian Jewelry, uh, headquartered in Washington. He's known as one of the most effective, highly respected leaders for a group like this uh, in Washington and made many trips to Ukraine and other countries. So we're very honored to have Mark with us. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. and. Uh, Tell us a little about your group and what you do and uh, your experience with uh, working with a wide variety of groups to move uh, Ukraine-U.S. relations forward. Morgan, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Far nicer uh, than, than, than deserved. Uh, I also want to thank you and the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, of which we're a member, for all the work uh, that, that, that you've done. And I also want to thank the ambassador, both for uh, our professional and, and personal relationship. We've had the opportunity to work together for many years. And uh, uh, even when uh, difficult issues have to be raised by one or the other, uh, we do it in a very straightforward, friendly way. And uh, it only, I think, highlights uh, the type of relationship that uh, has been established the, between successive Ukrainian governments and and the their Ukrainian Jewish community and the community that I represent here in in the United States. Some of you may be wondering why NCSEJ would be a, a member of the U.S. Ukraine Business Council. But I think it's important to remember that in, in, in Ukraine, as well as in many other countries, it's, it's the, uh, the, the, the international business community uh, working with their local partners that have, uh, in many cases, moved forward uh, civil society uh, initiatives. And uh, we value our membership. We value working with the council. Um, as we continue to try to strengthen the, uh, the, not just the relationship between the United States and Ukraine, but to try to improve the overall environment for all Ukrainian citizens. Um, you know, we're approaching the, th the 30th anniversary of the independence of Ukraine. And if you look back over the last three decades, you can see how far the country has come, particularly in comparison to some of the other uh, uh, countries in the region. Um, and yeah, as an organization, we, uh, we're actually, Morgan, you celebrated your 25th anniversary uh, last year. Uh, later this year, we're going to begin our celebration, commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the founding of NCSEJ. We were created originally to help get Jews out of the Soviet Union and to help those who wanted to remain. You know, since the uh, implosion of the Soviet Union, we focused on uh, working with the then emerging Jewish communities throughout the region, uh, of which Ukraine has the second largest population, uh, as well as trying to work with governments to uh, ensure the, uh, uh, the safety and well being of these communities and strengthening the bilateral relationship with the United States. Um, we, uh, uh, be, because it has uh, such a large Jewish population, we obviously spent a lot of time uh, uh, working inside Ukraine, working with the embassy here, uh, working uh, with the other organizations. And as I said at the beginning, uh, Ukraine has made much progress, uh, but there are still things to be done. Um, I wanted to really offer just a 
couple of personal observations. Uh, uh, one is that uh, it is clear where the Ukrainian people want to go. They want to be fully integrated into uh, uh, into Europe, into the larger uh, governments uh, that, that, that have represented them over the last 30 years. Uh, civil society is something that uh, I think, uh, you know, we in the United States uh, sometimes take for granted, but we see, uh, you know, we, we, we see how how important this is to the Ukrainian people and how hard they have fought to try to uh, create a, a, a more open and, and free environment uh, in, in their country. And I think, you know, in the coming years, it's something that we've talked about at different, uh, 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 th this current government and, for, and future governments to address issues related to rule of law and really ferreting out corruption. And making this uh, uh, um, you know, a, 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 an environment um, that promotes civil liberties, promotes uh, it, it, it promotes an environment where uh, businesses feel comfortable investing and uh, looking to protect the individual rights. Now, let me finish with just uh, two points. Uh, um, one of our major uh, efforts over these uh, last uh, uh, three decades has been to uh, fight uh, the rise of uh, anti-Semitism throughout the region. Fortunately, we've had good partnership to counter flare-ups that have taken place. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, over the years, there have been provocations from outside uh, actors to try, try to promote uh, 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 th these types of, uh, of actions. Um, we continue, and, and, and the ambassador in particular has been a, a true friend and partner uh, when these types of issues have come up. I think there's one area that in particular that, that, that we continue to work on, and that's uh, creating an accurate history of what took place uh, uh, during World War II and the Holocaust. And uh, uh, we want, you know, we, we, we understand the importance of, of national identity. We understand the importance of uh, of, of honoring those who are worthy of being honored. Uh, but this is an ongoing challenge and it's not unique to Ukraine alone, but it's something that, uh, you know, that, that that's, that's a, near the top of our agenda. So let, let me stop there, Morgan. And uh, once again, uh, congratulate the ambassador uh, for his uh, time in New York and Washington. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh... And thanks for, for your strong leadership for so many years. Let's turn to Steve Nix now. Steve and I met, met over 20 years ago. And I'll never remember when Steve made it. I'll always remember when Steve made a call to me in the early summer of 2004. and said, Morgan, I want you to be on an IRI presidential election of an observation team and go to Ukraine uh, for a very important election. He didn't tell me that we'd have to go three times and we'd have to have three elections before we could elect a president in Ukraine. But fortunately, I got to go three times. It was a great experience, and I always appreciate being a part of that presidential observation team. Steve lived in Ukraine for a while. He's worked for IRA for many, many years, and he's uh, been the top person for Ukraine. And he's met with many top leaders, and he promotes, uh, he's a lawyer, He's been promoting legal and judicial reform uh, and, of course, building democracy. So, uh, Steve, we'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, everyone, for joining. It's a real pleasure and honor to address this group. And I want to commend the Business Council for the, the outstanding work that, that you do in Ukraine. Secondly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the role that Ambassador Yelchenko has played here in Washington and to thank him for his statesmanship and his leadership really in guiding the bilateral relationship with what could best be described as somewhat turbulent times. So, thank you for everything that you have done. Uh, 
Morgan, thank you again. Uh, I'll just say very briefly, uh, I represent IRI, the International Republican Institute. I'm the director of Eurasia. Uh, I'm actually a displaced attorney, did civil litigation uh, for one of the big firms for a number of years, and then uh, had the, uh, the honor of working in Ukraine, serving as outside legal counsel to a committee of the Verhovna Rada, the Ukrainian parliament, and did that for four years. Upon returning to Washington, I had the good fortune of uh, being offered by Senator John McCain, the chairman of IRI, uh, to serve as, uh, as the director of Eurasia and to manage IRI's programming in the former Soviet states. In terms of our work in Ukraine, uh, we are focused on democracy promotion. So if you accept the proposition that a strong multi-party competitive political system is a hallmark of democracy, then you believe and invest in what IRI does. So we work with political parties. We also work with civil society. Uh, we work with, uh, with legal forces in terms of trying to build a strong independent judiciary. Uh, we're engaged in civil society. And very importantly, we work very closely on local governance. Uh, we work to train city councilmen on their duties and responsibilities. And this is all part of the great decentralization movement that we have seen taking place in Ukraine since the revolution of dignity. And I'll remind you that one of the demands of the Maidan during that time was increasing power in local government. So we work very hard on this decentralization project. All of these efforts are united to achieve one goal, building democratic institutions in Ukraine which will allow Ukraine to further and strengthen its ability to meet its commitments for, his, for its EU accession agreement and to bring Ukraine closer into transatlantic structures. Uh, the Ukrainian people in survey data have indicated their overwhelming desire to be part of Europe. So our work really is to help the Ukrainian people realize those hopes and ambitions. Again, I won't get into any Great detail, I'll be happy to take questions from people, uh, except to say that we remain engaged in, in a lot of activities related to elections. As Morgan pointed out, we, he was with us for one election observation mission. Uh, we would really like to include more members of the business council in these types of missions. So uh, unfortunately we had to cancel our observation mission to observe last October's local elections. But uh, let's remember that presidential and parliamentary elections are not that far away, uh, 2023 for parliament and then later in the year for presidential. So I hope, Morgan, we can work with you to get greater representation from the council uh, to go to Ukraine and observe these important elections that we will have fairly soon. And I'll end my remarks there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and thanks uh, to Mark for bringing up the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, of course, represents businesses. But we know to have a strong business environment, to have a democracy, to have civil rights, you have to have a lot of other organizations involved, many of them not-for-profit ones. So we welcome into our membership all organizations that work for democracy building in Ukraine, for human rights, women's rights, for uh, education, and all the various areas so we have about 25 not-for-profit members who contribute to the advancement of the society in Ukraine because we all work together to build a better and stronger uh, democracy and free enterprise environment in Ukraine. So we're kind of a gathering place for all those groups that do positive things to build a stronger Ukraine. So Mr. Ambassador, let's come to back to you quickly. Uh, the uh, president of Ukraine uh, has said recently he wants to put a new emphasis on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to promote investments into Ukraine and to promote exports from Ukraine. We know the top job of the ministry, of course, is foreign diplomacy, foreign relations. But the economic officers of uh, Ukraine are under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and they're in all your embassies around the world. So the president has said to all the ambassadors, uh, we want you to be uh, more uh, involved in economic development and uh, 
that's one reason you're opening up in Houston to have an office that focuses on economic development and ties with the United States. Tell us a little more about, and you're working, I understand, with Ukraine Invest. They have a new agreement with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to work with you on economic development. We from the business community think this is a very positive move that the MFA will be more involved in uh, uh, international investment uh, operations and exports from Ukraine. So tell us a little about this new emphasis from the president uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Well, thank you. Uh, for this is interesting uh, and, and difficult at the same time question. I cannot disagree, of course, with my president, but I should like to say that uh, you know, not everything can be done by Ukrainian diplomats. I think there are two things needed uh, in order to complement uh, the performance uh, of the Ukrainian embassies in the economic and investment sphere. And both things uh, lie in the domestic uh, domain of Ukraine. First of all, uh, the uh, more speedy, I would say, reform, uh, including the legislation, uh, which sometimes stands in the way of the of, of doing normal business with Ukraine. Uh, another part of this reform is, of course, judicial reform, because uh, it's not the secret that 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 many foreign companies, including United States companies, uh, very often uh, come across the, I would say, lacunas in the, uh, in the, in the law of Ukraine, and uh, uh, the very bureaucratic way uh, the courts in Ukraine uh, deal with economic and investment disputes, and 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 second. Uh, the task uh, uh, is to teach the Ukrainian business how to do how to do business in the United States. If if we we are discussing this country, and uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, in the Western world, because it's not just like many Ukrainian businessmen think that uh, you just sell and buy. It's much more complicated. To, in the United States, it's it's more or less clear with the countries of the European Union because Ukraine has the agreement on association and and, and free trade agreement with the with the EU, and uh, those rules and norms are more or less uh, uh, known to Ukrainian business. But when it comes to the United States, uh, well, you know of course better than than anybody else that. The system here is very much complicated. It's uh, it's hard. You have to to obtain a lot of um, uh, you know special um, I don't know uh, requirements, uh, sanitary you know tariffs and other things. But a lot of limits remain here. And that, that's what we are doing together with, uh, as you said, Ukraine Invest and, and some other associations in Ukraine. We are organizing from time to time the, uh, you know, the kind of events we, we have right now uh, in order to, uh, to tell the Ukrainian companies how to uh, easier enter the uh, American market. And uh, the figures which I gave you at the beginning of my introduction about the, the IT sphere show that uh, if you are uh, clever enough, and, and this is exactly uh, about the Ukrainian uh, IT sector, uh, you can uh, very, very quickly learn how, how to deal even without uh, traveling to the United States, especially it is important now during the times of pandemic. Uh, uh, to sum up, I would say that, uh, of course, the reform is needed also uh, uh, in the Ukrainian diplomatic service. Uh, you know, there is a dispute for many years whether the international trade should be covered by the uh, embassies of Ukraine and by the foreign minister of Ukraine, or it should be transferred, as it happened for a couple of years in the 90s, to the Ministry of Economy and Trade. At that time, it was called Minister of Economy and Trade. or uh, Minister of External Trade. 
And then we would come to the uh, model of some European countries which have the trade missions as a part, integral part of, of their embassies. Uh, and some of them, for example, I remember the case of Austria, some of them are uh, operating uh, on the commercial basis. They earn money from every contract they are following and, and implementing. Uh, this, this discussion, this dispute is still going on. So far it is in the hands of the Foreign Ministry of Ukraine, but I uh, will tell you very frankly that in my opinion and in the opinion of many other, my colleagues, uh, we don't have enough qualified personnel in trade, economic and investments field in the Foreign Ministry of Ukraine. So we need to concentrate now on the on, on preparation. We have the diplomatic academy. Mm -hmm. We have some other institutions, uh, for example, the Academy of, of, of Foreign Trade, if I remember correctly, uh, which should, so to say, produce more people with the uh, relevant knowledge uh, to deal with the outer world. But let me uh, in, uh, once again repeat that uh, I am absolutely convinced that that without the completion of reforms in this sphere in Ukraine, we will not be able to uh, to deliver the results which uh, which which President uh, uh, is expecting from from Ukrainian diplomatic missions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I certainly agree with your comments. We've been working for many, many years and we all agree that Ukraine could do more itself to promote their own exports and to promote international investment. We think this is a step in the right direction with the president putting some priorities on that, but there's still a lot of work to be due. Jeannie, I, I, Jeannie, I made my first trip to Ukraine in 1992. So it's going on almost 30 years where all my work has been on the economic development of Ukraine. When I first started going there, they would turn off the hot water a month every summer because it wasn't an, they had to, uh, not enough energy and they had to clean the pipes. Sometimes there was no heat, uh, it, but that's been improved. A lot of that's been because of electricity. Let's tell everybody what percentage of the electricity in Ukraine is produced from their nuclear plants and how important their nuclear plants are to energy security as well as to energy independence. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Ukraine is unique in that most of their electricity is um, generated from nuclear power plants, and that's uh, carbon-free baseload electricity. Um, so it's 24-7 uh, and it's clean. And I think those are two factors that countries all around the world are uh, attracted to because um, of the issues of climate change and also with disruptions in electricity, disruptions in fuel supply. So um, Ukraine is in a, a good situation in that they have accepted nuclear power and uh, have uh, taken the time to diversify their fuel supply and to upgrade their reactors so that um, they're serviced properly and that they can produce the uh, a, a maximum amount of electricity. And that's um, a very, that's a very in, uh, important part of their, uh, of their energy security. Yeah, I think it's at times uh, at least 60% or more of mm -hmm. all the electricity in Ukraine is produced from their nuclear plants. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also known for a long time that the nuclear plants are aging. Mm -hmm. and they need some remodeling, they need some upgrading. And some studies show that if they would remodel and upgrade the present reactors, not only would they be safer, but they could produce enough more electricity uh, that to, to take the place of two nuclear reactors, which we know that they're never built. We know mm -hmm. the Westinghouse has made uh, offers to the government of Ukraine to do that work and to show them how to modernize their reactors and to uh, produce a lot more electricity. But the government of Ukraine has not uh, responded to your offer or to other <laughs> offers. So uh, one thing we hope is that the government of Ukraine will start to recognize that they need to do a lot of work in remodeling and upgrading their reactors. And they can do that very cost effectively 
And of course, we would suggest that Westinghouse <laughs> would be the best company uh, to do that. So again, it's a very important important area, and uh, you got to take a long run view because if they don't take a long run view and improve their nuclear reactors, uh, there's going to be some severe difficulties out there. Uh, and as you as you said, it's a very critical uh, aspect of Ukraine's energy independence and having a uh, their own source of uh, of uh, uh, of energy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Mark, uh, you invited me out to the uh, major anniversary of Baba Yar. Most people know about the tragedy of Baba Yar. You guys, uh, I appreciated spending almost a week with you when when that happened, and it was a very amazing, enlightening experience for me. Uh, there's some work going on there, and soon there'll be another anniversary of Baba Yar. Tell us a little about that. And then secondly, it's not under your uh, organization, but I have to say that the humanitarian groups that the Jewish community has, one of them, the largest one, which is also one of our members, the work they do to feed, feed the elderly, to build senior citizen housing, the work that they do in humanitarian is amazing and, and massive in Ukraine and beyond what anybody else does. A few comments from you about Baba Yar and then about your amazing work of, of your broader organizations uh, in the humanitarian area. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, this, uh, the end of September, beginning of October will be the 80th anniversary of the massacre at Baba Yar where uh, tens of thousands of uh, Ukrainians, predominantly Jew- Jews, but others, were massacred by uh, by the Nazis, and uh, since independence, uh, uh, the Ukrainian government has held a, a major commemorative event every five years, and we've been uh, fortunate enough to participate in uh, in all of these events. And uh, as you noted, uh, this year will be the 80th anniversary. Um, uh, you know, COVID has uh, um, has as you can imagine, has caused uh, challenges in trying to figure out exactly what will take place, what can take place, but it's the expectation of the government and its partners that there will be a significant event uh, that will occur, I think, the the first week of October. There's also uh, ongoing plans to, uh, uh, to erect a museum and memorial to tell not only the story of Bobby R, but to, to give a broader uh, history of, uh, of what took place uh, during uh, World War II. Uh, uh, this has the full backing of the government. It was an initiative that was actually uh, suggested and started by the uh, current mayor of uh, Kiev. And uh, we continue to work with, uh, with the government and the community and others to try to hopefully... Uh, move this issue forward. Uh, the organization that, uh, that you referenced is, the, uh, is known as the Joint or the Jewish Distri- Joint Distribution Committee. They have done incredible work inside Ukraine uh, f- since, uh, since independence. Uh, literally, uh, I believe that they may be the uh, second or third largest uh, provider of humanitarian, uh, not non-government humanitarian assistance uh, uh, inside Ukraine. At any given time, they employ somewhere, I think, between 1,500 and 2,000 people. Uh, They do everything from uh, providing uh, meals on wheels, helping the elderly, providing uh, communal uh, support activities. And uh, it's really phenomenal work. And their work uh, while focused on the Jewish community, isn't exclusive to the Jewish community, and uh, um, it, it, it's something that uh, you know. Every time we go and and and, and uh, visit, whether it's in the capital or other cities, we see their their work firsthand. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, in uh, the, well, I still call it Dnepr Petrovsk, but in Dnieper, uh uh, they were part. They were responsible, and they were in a partnership to provide the first women's clinic. Uh, they they helped 
the, in partnership to provide the first school for special needs children. So uh, this is taking place across the country. And uh, it's, it's our hope that, uh, uh, that uh, they, they are planting the seeds so that local and national uh, groups can, t can take over the, the responsibility working in partnership uh, with both the, uh, the national and local governments in country. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, of course, a very important, and we're very happy to have them as a member, and their work is, like you said, astounding. And, of course, all of that uh, is, a, is a, of interest to the, hum uh, to the business community. The business community, of course, is also a large humanitarian group. They support lots of civil society organizations. They support lots of uh, private initiatives. They helped after the Putin's invasion of uh, Ukraine. They helped provide lots of humanitarian assistance, moving all their employees to new jobs. So the whole area of the private sector uh, helping in the humanitarian area in Ukraine is so critical and has been so important. And the private business community has played a, a major role in that. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, as you know, many people say Ukraine suffered casualties uh, in the last hundred and some years, probably as many as, as any other country in the whole world, getting caught in World War I, getting caught in World War II. And many people say that the three events of the Gulag, the uh, Holodomor, and the, Genesis, and the Holocaust all major tragedies within Ukraine, uh, millions and millions of people died. And they lowered, uh, they, uh, as you say, they just lined up thousands of people at Baba Yar and shot them. Uh, it's a real tragedy, never to be forgotten. And we're glad what you're doing uh, to uh, help that never be forgotten. Uh, when you go there, you go to any of those tragedies, it's just beyond belief, uh, man's, cruelty to man. Let's move to Steve. Steve, part of IRI is you guys have done all kinds of uh, public opinion surveys and checking the pulse of the people. What do the people really think? What do the people want? That's very important. And you've relayed that data to US officials and uh, Ukrainian officials. Tell us a little about uh, the, the role of IRI and doing all those uh, public uh, opinion so we know what the people really think and want in Ukraine. Sure, thank you, Morgan. We're happy to do that. Uh, IRI conducts regular national survey research in Ukraine. And we do this for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, to uh, help elected officials uh, be aware of what public opinion is and to help them formulate their reform agendas for parliament to help them create their legislative agenda uh, and to increase governance. In order to be responsive to citizens, government officials need to know what people are thinking, what their expectations are, what the issues that people want the government to focus on. Similarly, because we work with political parties, we provide that same data to political party leaders uh, because this data helps them with their messaging and voter targeting as they build their political parties. So, uh, it has both a governance uh, component and also a political component. And we see over the years a number of important trends. Uh, first and foremost, Ukraine is on a pro-European, pro-Western orientation. Every time we do a poll, we ask questions about whether Ukraine should be part of the EU or part of Russia's um, uh, commercial union, economic union. We also ask about NATO membership. And every time we do a poll, the number of citizens who support EU membership and NATO membership increases. So that is a clear trend in the polling, the Western orientation. Secondly, what we see is that uh, where people see reform and change in Ukraine is largely at the local levels. That's where people see things changing. Uh, people generally have a different opinion about the central government, the federal government, and their local government. Uh, people seem to like their mayors, like their city councils, and support the work that they're doing. 
So that's one of the reasons we're so engaged in this decentralization uh, project and to increase local government powers because that's where people see that their lives are being improved. And then the, the third component I would say is that, again, I alluded to the Western orientation. We also see some troubling trends in that the second most popular party, obviously uh, President Zelensky's party, Sluha Nogoda, is the most popular party right now, although their numbers have diminished in the past year and a half. They're still the most popular party. But the second most popular party is the pro-Russian party, uh, Opposition Platform. And we see trends in the data that uh, their support is gradually growing. And it's growing in the easternmost and southernmost parts of the country. So we watch that with some alarm, obviously. And we welcome uh, the recent moves by the presidential administration with regard to ownership of TV stations and other oligarchs who are openly pro-Russian. Uh, so we're watching these numbers very carefully. Obviously, we're working very closely with pro-Western parties, Luhan Noroda, uh, President Poroshen former President, President Poroshenko's uh, uh, Saldanar's party, uh, Yuli Tymoshenko's parties, and another interesting new component, this new party that has um, come on the scene, uh, the party of mayors, which is known as the uh, Propositia party. Uh, again, uh, a growth of this divide between the federal government and local governments. And then finally, uh, Kiev Mayor Vitaly Klitschko's uh, Udar party. So again, we're engaged with all these parties uh, and there's some interesting dynamics. Again, as we look forward to presidential and parliamentary elections when they occur in the future. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. Uh, very important information. Uh, we're also concerned, the business community is also concerned about some of those same issues. And we do want to point out that one of the major priorities of the U.S. government in Ukraine, as well as around the world, is to build democracies, to build uh, grassroots political parties, and to have free and fair elections. And the U.S. government does that many different ways, but they have two groups that, that they help support. One of them is yours, uh, IRI, International Republican Institute. And then there's a ca also another one, the National Democratic Institute, NDI, that also works in Ukraine to uh, support civil society, support the power to the people, support grassroots uh, economic development, which is totally opposite of what they had under the uh, communist system. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, one of your main jobs recently has been to try to find uh, Vaccine, COVID vaccine supplies for Ukraine. This has been a big challenge. You've talked to us several times about U.S. companies, about the U.S. government finding supplies for the for the people of Ukraine. Uh, this has been a difficult uh, task for you and, and for the government of Ukraine. There's been some improvement here, but those from the business community, we're very concerned about when uh, the employees of uh, uh, our members and, and the business community are going to be able to start being approved uh, or in the, the people that can be, be vaccinated. It doesn't look like that may come until late summer or even fall. That's a very deep concern to the business community who want all of those thousands of employees to also have vaccines. We're very, we hope the U.S. government is going to make vaccines uh, available soon to uh, to Ukraine. They've started to open them up. They're going to ship some to Canada and Mexico. <clears throat> but we think Ukraine should be high, high, high on the list for support from the U.S. government. And as you've told me, Ukraine doesn't just want to depend on Russia and China for their vaccines. That's not a good signal. The, the EU and the United States and, and uh, the West should be providing Ukraine with uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, your comments on that issue, sir. Uh, thank you, Morgan. Uh, yeah, this is an important issue, and this embassy worked hard starting from the last summer in order to uh, get closer to the real uh, needs and, and the, well, the start of the process of vaccination in Ukraine. I think there were two two major obstacles and, and major problems which are 
uh, which were fully uh, responsibility of of, uh, of Ukraine itself. First of all, uh, the belated start of uh, real negotiations with the major companies like Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson and Johnson, and some others, and uh, uh, which which led to the late contracting or signing of the contracts with those companies, which in turn led to the uh, you know very late uh, you know time of the real delivery of vaccines to Ukraine. Uh, so far, there are very limited numbers, like uh, you know, five hundred thousand or two hundred thousand of, of of Western vaccines, which which are about to be delivered or have already started to be delivered in Ukraine. But of course, this this uh, numbers are very small; they're not enough for Ukraine. Uh, uh, the Chinese vaccine, which you mentioned, uh, yes, it's probably uh, at the front pages of the media, but in reality, we're talking about not Chinese, but uh, Indian vaccine. Uh, ma many people in Ukraine, and this is another problem, they don't trust, they, they completely don't, don't trust the vaccination. And many of those, if, if not the majority, uh, you know, totally mistrust the Chinese. Uh, vaccine. So this is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. Uh, and uh, well, these, the third or the second and the half problem is that uh, we still don't have uh, uh, well prepared uh, uh, internal infrastructure, infrastructure on the spot in the regions, uh, which would allow people to get vaccinated uh, orderly. And uh, all those issues were mentioned in our initial negotiations, uh, which which the embassy organized with the uh, CEOs and um, you know, persons number two and number three in all companies I mentioned, which uh, started at the beginning of the last autumn. But unfortunately, the contracts were signed only at the beginning of the last year. That that's why Ukraine stands probably in the. Uh, you know, very late uh, uh, phase or, or term of, of delivery of, of, of vaccines. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, I'm still optimistic because we need to, uh, first of all, well, there are two issues which are very urgent, you know, to be sorted out. One of them you mentioned already, Morgan. This is about the the extra vaccine, which may may become available uh, and delivered from the United States. Uh, and we're very hopeful that the U.S. government and and USAID, which is by the way helping a lot uh, in preparing our medical infrastructure for vaccination, uh, so so that they will be able sooner than than later to give to Ukraine some additional portions of, of vaccine. The second uh, track is our negotiations with the countries like Israel, for example, because Israel contracted, as far as I know, uh, at least two, if, if not three times more vaccine that needed for its own population, which is already about 100% you know, vaccinated. But uh, the extra uh, volumes of vaccine contracted by Israel, if I am correct, uh, uh, they they were uh, contracted with Pfizer, and Pfizer is not uh, very willing and able just to give that extra amount to other country because there should be some document signed, the uh, um, well the testing should be done, and now our government is in the process of uh, of negotiations between. Uh, Ukraine, Israel, and Pfizer on that issue. And of course, the uh, extra vaccine, which uh, would have been available from the EU, unfortunately, uh, it's not uh, uh, available as we speak, because as you know, many European countries uh, uh, stopped vaccinations by uh, AstraZeneca because of the of some suspicious uh, or you know negative results of vaccination of some people in the Western U Europe, and now of course there's a period of uh, you know looking for the proper you know vaccine, 
uh, and of course we know that uh, uh, you know, the the best the advanced companies like Pfizer and uh, and Moderna are increasing the production of vaccines very quickly and uh, we hope that uh, uh, by the beginning of, of next summer, uh, the appropriate number of, of, of vaccines will, will be available at the international market. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say that uh, in terms of our members contacting me, the number one issue for them right now, the number one priority is to get their employees in Ukraine uh, vaccinated. Under the present uh, charts, which we've received from the government, people from age 19 to 59 with no underlying conditions, they're in a special category. And that category may not uh, be uh, open for vaccinations maybe till uh, August, September, October, November, uh, under the present uh, reality of the uh, rollout. Uh, that's a deep, deep concern to the uh, the business community. And that course, course means there's more shutdowns, small businesses are hurt, and Ukraine can't move forward with economic development. So we, uh, we as a business community certainly support the efforts of the government of Ukraine. We uh, are glad uh, that maybe the hope looks like the United States is going to be in a position soon to export more. They just recently opened it up and shipped some to Mexico and Canada. Frankly, my, my business members called me and said, we understand Mexico, but we're not sure we understand why the United States is shipping a vaccine to Canada. They, we, they think that uh, other countries like Ukraine, where U.S. business works all over the world, would have a much higher priority for the United States than, than Canada. They think Canada could probably take care of themselves. Maybe I'm speaking out of school, but that's what our members think who are involved in 60, 70, 80 countries around the world with major business operations, which, uh, of course, uh, are uh, very important to the economic development of the United States. So uh, whether Mark uh, and uh, Steve and Jeannie, everybody, we're encouraging everybody to do everything the way they, they can to help the government of Ukraine uh, establish its priority with the United States and with the EU and others. Uh, uh, and as, uh, as Steve pointed out, uh, people and the ambassador pointed out, people have a lot of questions about uh, uh, vaccine made in Russia or vaccine made in China or even made in India. And uh, some polls say that 50 or more percent of the people of Ukraine do not want to get vaccinated that way. To me, that's a real humanitarian crisis. It's a crisis for the business community because of the tens and tens and tens of thousands of employees that they have in Ukraine who've not had a chance to be vaccinated. And it may be four, five, six, seven months before they do have a chance. So we're pleased to try to highlight what we think is a, is a huge crisis for the business community, as well as for uh, uh, the people of Ukraine. So let's go back to, to Mark. Any, uh, uh, any wrap-up comments from you? What, what about your observations about what the U.S. government can do or, or what the Ukraine can government to do to uh, strengthen uh, relations? First, of course, the United States government can make uh, vaccines available to Ukraine. But after that, Mark, what would be your observations? Is Mark still with us? He was going to have to leave at 11, I believe. Well, Morgan, I think uh, we need to... I'm, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Morgan, uh, I'm here. Uh, I think it's to, uh, to really expand the relationship between the United States and Ukraine uh, moving forward because of uh, some of the the past controversies and issues that appeared to be resolved, um, and it's it, it's it's our hope that uh, uh, that the, the United States and Ukraine will figure will will figure out a way 
to uh, to to target those uh, areas that are that are most needed. Uh, this should be a economic and uh, at, at, at a social level. So it, it, it's going to require some creative thinking. It's going to require a, a strong commitment on, on, on the part of the Ukrainian government to, to really address those areas of concern of, 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 of their citizens. And that's where I think this, you know, the strong support will continue from uh, from the U.S. Congress and from the uh, from the Biden administration. So I go back to what I said a minute ago, uh, a few minutes ago, about dealing with rule of law, dealing with corruption, trying to build uh, and strengthen civil society institutions. It's going to be those institutions that will provide the foundation for a, for a brighter future for, for all of Ukraine. And thank, you very, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Jeannie, your final comments uh, about moving U.S.-Ukraine relations forward. Thanks, Morgan. Um, first, I wanted to make a comment um, for the ambassador. I just remember one of our first uh, Ukraine Business Council meetings when he first came to Washington and he said, I'm here for you, I'm here for business. And uh, I can honestly say from experience that he and his staff were have been very supportive of business. And I wanted to thank him for that, that leadership because uh, it really made a difference. Um, and I think going forward, I am encouraged that the new administration will continue to have a very close relationship with, with the Ukraine government. Um, I hope that Ukraine will continue to look west and that they will continue to fight misinformation campaigns that come from certain countries or a certain country. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeannie. Uh... Uh, we look forward to working with you and other businesses to continue the fight, continue the battle for competition in Ukraine. Our biggest uh, problem is state monopolies and private monopolies. Uh, demonopolization is still a huge issue out there uh, and one that uh, we need the United States uh, to be very active on and others because demonopolization is still a huge hindrance to uh, development of the business community. Now let's turn to uh, Steve. Steve, you've been involved in many, many years. You've seen it come and go. Uh, your observations about it moving our relationship with Ukraine forward. Sure, thank you, Morgan. I'll, I'll conclude by saying that we've had our ups or downs, ups and downs over the years, but clearly uh, Ukraine is on a Western path. Uh, our job is to keep it on that path and I'll just note that before he passed, uh, Senator McCain's admonition to me and to IRI was keep Ukraine on that path to Europe. So that's what we intend to do. Uh, we have our largest program in the former Soviet states is in Ukraine. We're dedicated to Ukraine. We consider that part of John McCain's legacy. And so we will continue to fight that good fight. Thank you for inviting me today. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we all know that uh that fight's got to continue. We, all, we all, all know that those who are against what we believe in and what you just said, they're well-funded. They're politically uh, powerful. Uh, they fight hard. They fight tough. Uh, and so the opposition is, uh, uh, we got to be stronger. We got to be more together. We got to be more influential. Uh, in all of the, from the government of Ukraine to the West uh, to fight the opposition because uh, let's not underestimate them. Look how powerful they've been. Look how they always come back uh, to maintain their monopolies. And then with the support of Russia, it's, uh, it's, it's been a formidable force. So we got to continue to fight and fight hard. Now, Ambassador, your final wrap up, your final comments. Well, as I said, Morgan, I think you remember well during our very first meeting, uh, which was massively attended by more than 70 people, 
your friendly luncheon I mean, uh, sometime in January last year, uh, I'm always at your disposal. Unfortunately, yes, I'm leaving and, and, and uh, yeah, the new ambassador will come, but I think that this is the major task of, of any Ukrainian uh, ambassador here and, then Ukra and any Ukrainian embassy in the world to be at the disposal of not only uh, our own business, but also uh, for the business uh, of the host country, especially in the United States, because if we talk about the need for more investments in, in Ukraine, we need to be more open, we need to, to tell people widely about the opportunities in Ukraine, and, and also to deliver our promises. And in that sense, of course, the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council is absolutely essential, and, and your personal role, Morgan, and the role of all members, including those who are present here and those who are absent as well, uh, to promote this, as I said in my, in my introductory uh, intervention. So thank you very much again. I, I, I would like also to, to pay tribute and to mention uh, uh, our key economic officer who is sitting to the right of me, Pavlo, who is uh, also completing his term in this country at the beginning of April. And uh, he's going back to Ukraine, but I'm pretty sure that he will stay available. He will be dealing, even if he doesn't want to, but he will be dealing with the U.S.-Ukraine, uh, you know, relations, uh, be it economic or political, whatever, because he has a great knowledge about this country and about our bilateral ties. I would like to thank him for, uh, uh, how to say, it, for making easier for me to come closer to the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council and to the economic issues, we, which never been my priority because simply of uh, my my previous career, but I know how important they are for any country of the world. And that's why, uh, once again, I think that the, the, the presidential task uh, uh, is, is very timely. And, and I'm pretty sure that we will deliver some results very soon with the help of, 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 of people like Pavlo sitting back in Ukraine with understanding uh, of the situation on both sides of Atlantic. So again, thank you very much. It's good, it's good to see you again. Uh, whatever position I will take in future, I will never forget you and, and, uh, and the United States. After all, I've spent in this country more than 15 years altogether. That's why the U.S. has become the, well, I wouldn't say my second motherland, of course, it would be too much, but, but the country which I know well, I understand the Americans very well, and I strongly believe in the bright future of our bilateral relations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thanks for mentioning Pablo. Uh, he's been a great help to us. He, uh, he's always been very cooperative and very supportive, and we, uh, we hate to see him go, but we consider him now extension of all of our work in Kiev, like many of the other people who have left, uh, who worked here, who are key people in Ukraine, who are ambassadors to other countries. Uh, we think they're a part of the extended network. And so, Pablo, thank you very much. We're sorry that we can't have a, a big party for both of you in person at this time. But uh, uh, maybe sometime in the future, uh, uh, we can do that in Kiev or wherever you are and again and get to celebrate your service. So as we wrap up here, we have to say, as, uh, as Marcus said and as Steve and Jeannie, the work to build Ukraine still is in progress to make it a free, independent, democratic, wealthy country. We all have to work together. Uh, we have to be stronger. We have to be more powerful. And even though Ukraine have to do a lot of it itself. We know it can't do it by itself. It needs strong support from the EU. It needs strong support from the United States, from international financial organizations. It needs strong support from all the private voluntary organizations that work on uh, legal and issues, uh, civil society, democracy, human rights, civil rights, women's rights, all the other education, Everybody has to work together. 
it's a huge fight. Uh, the battle continues. So let's uh, continue to work together. Let's continue to combine our forces. Let's circle the wagons because we know how tough the opposition is. So again, thanks to everybody. We look forward to working in 2021. And as we say at the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, full speed ahead. Thank you, everybody. We'll see, then one week from today, we have another webinar with the head of the State Fiscal Service in Ukraine. Uh, the head of the State Fiscal Service is a very important agency. They want to build better relationships with the business community. And so we'll be sending out an announcement soon about the head, a very powerful agency in Ukraine that we'll meet with one week from today and talk about relations between the business community and the State Fiscal Service. So again, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, Mark had to leave to another meeting, but uh, uh, best wishes and uh, full speed.